Good morning, everybody. First Corinthians chapter six. We'll be continuing on this morning. I hope everybody's had a wonderful week. God has truly blessed us. Give us health and strength to be here. Thank God for that. Thank God for everybody that's here this morning. We we'll pray the Lord will feed us from His table. According to what I read, when we show, all we got to do is show up, and all things are prepared. <laughs> so this morning we can. Dine with the Lord and sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning. We ask you in the lovely name of Jesus that you would give us unction from thy spirit to teach and preach a word. We know we can do nothing without you, Lord. You said, I am the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. And without the spirit of God, we can do nothing this morning. And we pray that it is that Holy Spirit that abides in every born again child of God that is our teacher and our guide. And Lord God, you said that He, the person of the Holy Ghost, would lead us and guide us into all truth. And that is our desire this morning, Father Lord, is to see Thy truth, to hear Thy truth, to read Thy truth, and to receive Thy truth. And not only be a hearer of Thy word, Lord God, but a doer. And we pray this morning, that you would give us the ability to understand the spiritual aspect of what we are learning about this morning. God, we love you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we got down to last week through verse number 8 of chapter number 6. Where it said, you do wrong, you defraud, and that your brother. And verse number 9 will start out and say, know ye not. That the unrighteous shall not. It does not say may not. It does not say might not. It says shall not. Inherit the kingdom of God. And that's a question Paul poses to the Corinthian believers. He said do you not know this? Of course it's a rhetorical question. He already knows the answer. Much like when God said Adam where art thou? He knew the answer. But he's trying to drive home a point. With all of the things that have been discussed thus far, from the very first chapter up to this point about human wisdom, about leaning on the arms of the flesh, about schisms and separations and divisions that human wisdom brings into the sanctuary of God amongst His people, dividing them, setting them in different camps and little cliques and things like that, that's not of God. And he also talking about how that there was open sin, Amongst the congregation that was not dealt with accordingly. But rather they boasted in it. Instead of being grieved over it and weeping over it. And dealing with the matter. And also here we have another instance at the beginning of chapter 6. Where there is people in the congregation going to law with one another. And it's ungodly. It's a, all them things are ungodly. The Bible said that. God is not the author of confusion. Amen. If there is divisions among people, then there's confusion. That's just all there is to it. If one person says, I believe the Bible says this, and another person says, well, I think the Bible says this about that, then there's going to be confusion. There's going to be division because automatically they're divided on the, in two camps over that. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is not up to a private interpretation. That's what the Bible says. Peter tells us that. The Bible is inspired by God. It's preserved by God. It's, it's actual revelation from God from heaven to the mind and heart of man through the Holy Spirit of God. That's the conduit where it gets to us. The Bible tells us you must be born again. If, you don't, if you're not saved and born again, you cannot receive the things of God. That's the Bible. But here he's telling them, Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And it's important to understand that the word nor is used between both of those. All, all those words. It doesn't say or if this or if that. It doesn't say if you are guilty of one of these, you can do the other ones. No. The Bible tells us if a man keep the whole law and offended, and yet at one point you're guilty of the whole law. Mm -hmm. 
Paul is saying that none of these things are going to enter into God's kingdom. You read, you know, last Wednesday night, we talked about Revelation 20. If you go on and read 21, you, hear, you read some glorious things. And one thing tells us that nothing that defiles will ever enter into God's kingdom. His eternal kingdom, there will be no sin. Praise God for that. It's going to be a perfect place where righteousness dwells. Now, right now, righteousness does dwell on this earth in the person of the Holy Ghost abiding in the bosom of the believer. But the world is under the influence of the devil. The Bible teaches us that. He's the God of this world. Little G-O-D. But it tells them here, he's saying, do you not remember? Don't you understand? Is it not settled in your heart that people that do these kinds of things will not enter into the kingdom of heaven? And he goes on to say, but such, he said, such were some of you. That's everyone who's sitting in this room today. We were sinners. If you are saved and born again this morning, you were a sinner before God. You were condemned to die. You were born in, in sin and conceived in sin and shaped in iniquity. The Bible tells us this even in the Old Testament. Psalms tells us that. David said that. In sin did my mother conceive me. And a lot of people say, well, I wasn't conceived in sin because my parents were married. That's not what that's saying. No, sir. It means that every person who is born physically into this world is a sinner before God. Else, why would God say, for God so loved the world, everyone, all sinners. God died for all sinners. Praise God for that. Whosoever will, let him come. That means that anyone... No matter what their creed is, no matter what the color of their skin is, what their nationality, where they're from, what their culture is, it doesn't matter. Any of those things don't mean nothing to God. Amen. God is looking at the soul of man. Amen. The Bible teaches us man looks on the outward appearance. What do we got here in this country nowadays? Everything, everything is focused on race and the color of your skin. If you are not this color, then you cannot participate in politics or whatever. That is man-made garbage. Racism should not exist because it doesn't even make any sense to the child of God. If you know, every Christian that's born again is saved inside. They're saved, doesn't matter what the outside looks like. If the Bible said, you know, when the Lord Jesus called Peter and sent him over to Cornelius' house, Cornelius was not a Jew. And in contrary to all the movies that we see, Jews are not white English folks. That's the way the movies portray them. It doesn't matter. We don't know, folks. It doesn't matter what color their skin was. It does not. That means nothing. God, they were of the, the seed of Abraham. The seed of Isaac was the spiritual seed. And then there's Ishmael. Ishmael was a mixture of Israelite an Egyptian. And they were not part of the promised seed. God cast them out. He told, he said, cast them out. Sarah, Sarah was the one that come up with the idea. Abraham gave into it and went and lay with Hagar, her handmaid, because she wasn't wanting to wait on God. And Abraham yielded to it when God had already told him, of thine own Seed. Amen. It wasn't going to be Eliezer from Damascus. It was going to be a child born of him and Sarah. Amen. Specifically them two people. Which is where the seed was coming from. So we know, we, we know all the story about that. And we know that uh, Ishmael. The Bible says that he would be like a wild ass. In the desert. Kicking and snorting around. His hand would always be against his brother. Look at the Middle East. Do you not see the physical manifestation of that today? Every nation that's around Israel hates Israel. And they claim through Abraham that that land is theirs. It's not. It's of the children of Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve tribes. No sons of Ishmael were in there. It wasn't from Esau neither. Esau was of the seed of Isaac, was he not? 
And see, it's so funny if you look at these things and what we're talking about here, knowing that you've been born again, knowing that there are some people that ain't going to heaven. The world don't like to hear that, do they? True. Everybody's going. You go to a funeral nowadays, the person died, they went to heaven. Yeah. It don't matter what. They could have been a drug dealer. They could have been a murderer, a rapist. Yeah, well, he's at, he's at peace now. If a person dies without God, they're in hell. And they're not, they're, there is no peace. The Bible said where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And, and that there's an outer darkness where the worm dies not. They don't get annihilated. They don't just turn into a pile of ash. There's no purgatory for you to go give money to some pope or priest and pray them out of there. It ain't going to happen. The Bible talks about death is when the body and soul are separated and the Bible tells us that a person that's saved and born again goes to be with God. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. Amen. And the Bible tells us, like the rich man said, he died and he lifted his eyes in hell. And right after that it said it being in torments. It's, a, it's almost too terrible to speak of. There is not a whole lot of preaching on hell today. There's not a whole lot of teaching on hell because people don't want to hear it. That's like the Bible. Everything that... That the prophets had to say, everything, almost exclusively that the prophets had to say was negative. Through the Old Testament. Because God had to send them because they weren't right. Mm -hmm. Why do you think God calls preachers and teachers and evangelists for the church? It's the same concept, ain't it? We need help. We're constantly had to be told. It, Dad said it does Wednesday night. We have to have instruction. If you read in 1 Timothy, or I believe it's 1 Timothy 3.16, or maybe 2 Timothy 3.16, where it says, For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, it's profitable for correction, instruction, reproof. All of them things, three of those four that it gives is negative. No, do you like somebody to come and tell you, Hey, you're messing up, David. You ain't doing that right. Instantaneously. You go on the defensive instantaneously. Your flesh is like, who in the world is this guy to tell me? And then you start going through a laundry list of, well, what about when he did this or he did that or he does this or he does that? And you just go on it and it completely just punt the thing and punt it down the field. What they told you that was wrong. It's, a, it's against our natural man to deal with our faults and failures. God, God forces us to do it. And the inner man, when you get born again and saved, the Spirit of God lets you do it. There's a way to fix that problem. When we fall short of the glory of God, which we will, or in this flesh, the Bible said we have an advocate with the Father. Amen. He said, little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you do, we, the saints, have an advocate. Amen. You can get right with God. But you have to confess and repent and get forgiven for it. You can't just say, oh Lord, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. The next thing you know, you're doing it again. Repentance means that you turn. You turn your face away from it and turn your back on it. You don't go back and wallow in the same thing perpetually for your whole life. So that's what he's telling here. Such were some of you, but ye are washed. For a person to be saved and born again, their sin has to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Their sins have to be washed away. There's only one cleansing uh, agent that can do that. That's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. His sinless blood has to be applied to the doorposts and the limbs of our heart. we got to get washed from our sin. He said, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. How is that possible? The blood of the Lamb. That's all there is to it. God can cleanse you. And then he says, but you are sanctified. Do you know what sanctified means? It means to be set apart. That you are a peculiar people now. You are in a camp that's of God. And you are to be a representation of that. And an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life should be dedicated to God. And he also says, and you are justified. Which is one of the greatest terms in all of the Word of God. When you think about a sinner, the Bible uses the law. He uses God as being a judge. 
The commandments are things. Just everyone can understand what laws are, right? Everybody knows that there are laws for our county, our city, our state, our nation. There's laws that are written down. And if those laws are broken and you get caught, you have to answer for that. So it's easy to understand. When you break God's law, you got to answer to God. That's all there is to it. That's, that's how it is. But the Bible tells us that we're sinners like we said before. We're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We're all born a sinner. We need a Savior. So that's how people get confronted that they are in need of salvation. Because they've broken God's laws. They've transgressed against God. They are, have to be faced with their sin. When you tell somebody, have you ever stole anything? And then most people, I'd probably say, if we raise our hands in here, I'm not asking you to do it. We probably, almost everybody in here would probably say, yeah, I have physically stolen something. Have you taken a pen from work? You say, uh, God ain't going to hold me accountable for that. Verse 10 said, nor thieves. A thief ain't going to get into heaven. Yeah, but they shortchanged me on my bonus. So I had to get it some other way. It doesn't matter what rationale you use to try to justify your sin. It ain't going to work before God. And the Bible tells us also that we've been justified because what that means is on God's account. Remember we talked about that word reckon? It's an accounting term. When The Bible tells us our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God tells us when we get saved... Our sins are remembered no more, praise God. In God's eyes, through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and through His blood, He looks at us as though we are just like His Son. He is sinless, therefore we are, because His righteousness was imputed. It wasn't earned. He gave it to us. If we receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we believe on the death, the burial, the resurrection, and we repent and believe the gospel, then that record is wiped clean. Therefore, it looks to God as though we have never sinned. Amen. We're justified before Him. Amen. And it tells us also, in the name of our Lord Jesus there's a lot of people who love the name Jesus, love that He teaches things, oh, the Sermon on the Mount, all these wonderful things, blessed are the peacemakers and all these things, but they don't want Him as Lord. They don't want Him to rule over their life. If God saves a person, He is Lord. If a person is lost and dies and goes to hell, Jesus still is Lord. <laughs> it don't matter who it is. God made Him that way. The Bible said, whom God hath made both Christ and Lord. That's all there is to it. And Peter even said it, be it known unto y'all. Everybody who's here. And then, of course, it's written in the Word of God for the whole world to read. But it tells us right here that in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit. So it's through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on the death, burial, and the resurrection, and also by the Spirit of God, which is given to us at the time we're born again. <laughs> Praise God. So here is a picture that Paul puts out of all the things that man does in his flesh. The wickedness and the vileness and the sin of mankind standing next to the justification by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and His atonement. And how that, considering all the things that they were doing wrong, he said, you're a saved and born again child of God. You are not to be living in those things anymore. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, look. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. We got a new life. We got new desires, new wants. And things that are in the soul of man that are longing for God. They want to read His Word, want to attend His house, want to be with His people, want to worship Him in spirit and truth. But there is a battle that takes place. Romans 7 talks about it. When Paul said, Therefore, when I go to do good, I find there's evil present with me. The things that I would do, that I do not, and that I would not do, that I do. That's what Paul said. He said, look, well, I try to go do the things that are good. The flesh 
cut rises up against me. And if I yield to it, I end up doing the opposite of what I want to do, what the inner man wants to do. So when a person is walking in the flesh, they are not walking in the spirit. That's, right. that's, that's obvious, ain't it? You cannot do two things at the same time. The world likes to say, hey, you, I, love, I love multitaskers. If you're doing two things at once, both of them is going to be messed up. You got to focus on what you're doing. Now, I understand what that means, but what I'm saying is two things cannot happen at the same time. When you're physically doing something, you cannot be hammering a nail and drilling a hole at the same time. That does not happen. You ain't an octopus. You only got two arms. You have to realize that things in the Christian spiritual realm are either lined up under the flesh or they're under the spirit. The Bible gives us an actual list. You say, well, I didn't know that was ungodly. The Bible says, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. There's a lot of things that are in this book that we need to apply to ourselves. The Bible says, withhold not honor from him whom it is due. Withhold not good unto him that it is due when it is in thine hand to do so. If you have the ability to help someone and you refuse to do it, you have sinned against God. Amen. Do you understand that? Ain't that crazy? And you say, well, I don't like that person. They were saying you did it against God. Absolutely, Brother David. That is an absolute fact. Because he's the standard. We have no law. We have no standards. Man left to himself, what happens? Destruction. Death. You don't teach a child what's right. What does the Bible say happens? Brings their mother to shame. He that spareth a rod hateth his son. And, and there is the world is absolutely opposite of that. They will tell you if you beat your kids, quote unquote, that's the word they like to use. There's a difference between discipline and a child and abusing a child. Right. There is no man on this earth that has a right to punch their kid in the face, nope. to kick them, to jerk their hair around and throw them around. Nope. That is not discipline. No, that's right. Abuse. That's, a, that's, that's disgusting is what that is. But if you take them and tan their hide, the Bible commands you to do it. Yeah. God, Amen. He that loved his son, he, the Bible said, he that hateth his son that withholds the rod, hates his son. But he said, he that loveth him, chasteneth him, betimes, many times. Do you not, I mean, and every one of us in here probably has got a lot of whippings. I deserve way more than I got. I'm going to tell you that right now, right? And, and if everybody's honest, you can say, yeah, there's some things that, that slipped under the rug that I got away with. Or sometimes that your parents should have whipped you, but they didn't because they had mercy on you. Praise, yeah, they did, you didn't find out, but you know, God knows about it. And see, the thing about it is, when you become a parent, you remember your childhood. And you remember, and you see your kids do things that you did. And, you, and then they're just astonished at how you found out about it. How in the world did you know? Because you're me. I did that. I mean, and, and, and a lot of things, times, it could be vice versa. Some kids do worse than their parents, and some parents that did worse than their kids. I mean, like I was trying to explain to my kids this morning, you, we ought to be getting better each generation. You ought to teach your children things that they can pass on. Right here. And you, ought to, and you take the good things that helped you, and all the bad things, and you get rid of them, and you pass on the good to your, your kids. And the things you did wrong that brought destruction, you need to tell them about it. Tell them if you do that, you're going to destroy yourself. And you can always back up the truth with the truth. Right here. This is where it comes from. But notice it says here, we got a dual nature. But in verse 12, it says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. 
This verse is important. We're under the grace of God. Amen. We're not under the law. Amen. The law has been fulfilled for every one of us that's saved. According to Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. There are laws and commandments that are given to us in the church, though. He said, he said, if you read 1 John, you'll find out about it. Love one another. If you love God and you love your neighbor, everything falls in line. That's right. Period. That's right. and, and when I say you love God, that don't mean I just say, I love God. When you say you love Him, you do what He says. That's right. How say that you love me? <laughs> Is that not Bible? Where'd you learn that from? The Word of God. That's right. And then you say, you love the Lord. And there are things that are explicitly explained that we are not to partake in in this life as a child of God. And there are things that are not explicitly explained. The Bible does not, for instance, say, thou shalt not play cards. Right? A lot of times you'll see that on one of them church covenants. Yeah. We have agreed not to play cards. Do you think solitaire, like if you're playing solitaire, that you're sinning against God? There are some things that are innocent, but they can pull you away from God. The Bible talks about sins and weights. Let us lay aside every sin and weight that does so what? Easily beset us. The way that you understand things that are contrary to God's word is you have to read his word. You have to study His Word. You have to hide it in your heart. The Spirit will tell you right from wrong. You will have that pulling of the Holy Ghost. If you, see, we have liberty to do things in this life. But we have to apply the Word of God to every choice and every situation that we're in. All of our associations. All of the things that we give money to. All of the things that the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we dress, who we associate with. The church we attend, the book that we read, all these things, things we watch and things we hear, all these things have to be filtered through the Word of God. It has to. And some people, you hear Christians say things like, God has not convicted me of that. But at the same time, it's in the book. Right. There is no praying. There is no debating what you should do, whether you should or should not do something that is explicitly written in the Word of God. If you say that, you're advertising your ignorance. You're just saying, I haven't read it. And don't plan on reading it. I ain't doing it. What does that sound like? Rebellion. That's exactly what it is. Sin is, in essence, rebellion. Any person who claims to be a Christian and they're presented with the Word of God and they, they kick at it and fight at it, they're sinning against God. I don't care what you say this morning. God's Word is true and we're the liars. Amen. Romans 3, 4 tells us that. God don't care what I say about it. God does not care what anyone else says. He says, thus saith the Lord. The, God never called anybody and sent them to any group of people that, that don't belong to Him and said, hey, go tell them what you think about it. He never said that. Never will. Because our words don't profit. It's His words. So, and He says here, I'm not going to be brought under the power of anything. The Bible speaks of things that we may do that may ne not necessarily be a sin, but it can be a stumbling block to our brethren. Right? And the Bible said that if you do that, and you know you're doing it, you're sinning. Even though that particular thing may not be a sin. Like there's an example in the Bible about eating meats that were offered to idols. Some of the weaker people wouldn't do it. Because they thought they were sinning against God. But Paul said, we know that, that it, idols are nothing. They're nothing. They can offer stuff to, they can go out here and offer a pig to a stone all day long. That doesn't make that a God. But some people who are weaker could say, he's eating meat that all, was offered out as Paul said, I wouldn't eat that until the world, while the world stands, if it causes him to stumble and fall. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can study that out. 
But the Bible tells us meat for the belly and belly for the meats. Now here's a saying that was famous in that day. Pretty much saying the simple task like, hey, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Hey, we got appetites and God ain't going to... God ain't going to hold us, anything against us, for fulfilling those appetites. That's hedonism. You know what that means? If it feels good, do it. That's what the world says. Exactly. Don't, don't restrain your kids from doing what they want to do. You're holding them back. So if you tell your kid not to touch a stove by and they go put their hand on it, you're holding them back. No. If they get close to it, you bust that hind end. Because if you don't, they're going to burn themselves. Could be scarred for life. I mean, ch children have to be taught. These things are important. And he says here, but God shall destroy both it and them. And here's the window that we need to look through, folks. We've said this many times, and it's been said here so much that the world is going to burn. Literally. God's going to torch this thing and melt it down to the very elements. It's the, even the elements themselves shall melt with fervent heat, the Bible says. And then Peter even says, consider in these things, what manner of persons ought you to be? That's a question for the child of God. What kind of person should we be if everything in this world is meaningless? And we know where all of the good things lie. We know where all the benefits lie. We know where uh, if we do certain things that God calls us to do, that they will echo through the ages. Those things will last. It doesn't matter what I say. Or what you do, or what you say, or anything like that. God, what matters is what God tells us to do. That's all there is to it. If we do what God says, we're gonna never go. We're never gonna go wrong. We're never gonna go wrong. But He tells us here. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. This is an important thing to understand. The world teaches a simple truth. I. We'll do what I want to do. It's my life. I get to do what I want to do. The Bible says that no man lives or dies unto himself. Did anybody say well, before they were born, I'm going to be born? Obviously not. That's foolish to think something like that. Did anybody choose to be born? No. God ordained that we be born. And our lives, our souls, our spirits, our bodies belong to God. Saved or lost. He's our creator. He, we belong to him. And the Bible tells us that uh, all of these sins are marks of those that are headed to hell. Of the flesh. Right? John chapter 3 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he's, Paul here is talking about the kingdom of God, which is the abode of God and also the kingdom that's coming on this earth. We talked about Wednesday night. In God's kingdom, that stuff is not going to be there. He, he'll deal with it with a rod of iron. But notice that what it says here is that these things are for the Lord, but it specifically mentions fornication. The Bible tells us right here, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by His own power. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. <coughs> Meaning, in no way should that ever happen. No, it shouldn't happen. So the Bible tells us that our bodies are members of Christ. Let me read you a scripture right here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 30. The Bible tells us this wonderful truth right here. Ephesians 5.30 says, For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. That's talking about the church. We're partakers of Him. So when we go to try to do some wicked sin, such as fornication, the Bible tells us that we are to consider this. And He also uses the things where He says, Make the members and harlot. God forbid. Let me read you some more scripture. Romans chapter number 6. Verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? A lot of church teaches that you can. They do. There's churches in our town. 
who will specifically say to get people to come, we're not going to judge you. We're not going to look at your life and preach to you that you shouldn't do this or that. Just come on in. Everybody's welcome. And that's a very fine line to walk down. Everyone is welcome in God's house. But if you preach the Word of God, you will preach against sin. And if you're preaching to sinners, you're going to preach about the gospel. If you're preaching to Christians, you're going to preach about holy living and sanctified life and separation from the world. And you're going to talk about them things. Because it's full of it. You cannot preach the Word of God without preaching them things. There's no way to do it. And it tells them here. So, should we sin that grace should abound? No. No, the Bible specifically talked about when we went through the book of Jude. That it said they've turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. Meaning that, hey, if you commit a sexual sin, it's alright. No, it ain't. Not with God, it's not. Notice what it says here. i got a couple other scriptures that I want to read to you. So we read Romans 6 and 1 right there. Let's look at this one. John, chapter number 5. Now this is the Gospel of John. Chapter number 5 and verse 14. Now this is the Son of God. This ought to ring true to you. We all know this story right here. Let's, let's look right here in verse number 10. The Jews therefore said unto him, that was cured. It was a Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Now you know the Lord healed this man, told him to pick up thy bed and walk. Of course, he's going back and forth with the Pharisees. And they answered him and said, He made me whole. And same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then they asked of him, What man is it what said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. And afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Notice this. This is a wonderful scene. God healed the man, right? And then was absent. But later on, he came back to him. Like when you get saved and born again, you're going to have to grow a little bit. And God come back to you and little by little, he teaches you things that you start pulling yourself away from. Right? So notice what he says here. You're not going to instantly know everything when you get saved. It's a lifelong journey of wisdom and learning and growing. <laughs> now notice what he says here. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, thou art made whole. What does that say right there? Sin no more. Lest a worse thing come upon thee. We're all sinners, correct? Now, if, and, I, and I've got another scripture that's like this that we're going to read. But what do you think it says, sin no more? Does that mean to be sinless? Don't continue in the sin that you are living in. Right? If you take the Bible and compare Scripture with Scripture, it's easy to see that's the truth of that Scripture, right? Jesus doesn't say, you're sinless now. Go under your own power and don't sin. No. He's saying that you were committing sin, but what you were doing, don't do it no more. All right? And I'm going to prove that with this next scripture. If you turn over and look at the same book, chapter number 8, there's a different scenario that happens here. Verse 1 says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning He came again into the temple, and all the people came unto Him and sat down and taught them. And He taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto Him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto Him, Master, this woman was taken in the very act. And I'm not going to read this rest of this for time. We know the story. But notice right here in verse 11, or verse 10, When Jesus had lifted Himself up, He saw none but the woman. All of her accusers went away. Because the Lord said, Let he without sin cast the first stone. And they all left. But he said, Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, What? Neither do I condemn thee. And sin no more. Whatever you were doing, don't do it no more. It's a cardinal doctrine of the Word of God. That when a person gets saved and born again, their life is different. They do not continue in the same trash the rest of their days. 
A true born again Christian may slip, may fall. But if you look at their overall life, they're headed toward righteousness. They're not living in perpetual sin. It ain't going to happen. But we'll stop right there. I hope you got something out of that this morning.